we've got alarms going off and everything right now. Wow. I think that means it's time, right? Yeah. It's so funny. You guys are all so loud until it's time for church. And I was like, <laughs> this happens before our five o'clock service too, right? It's like everybody's talking, then it's time for prayer. Like, I wonder if it would be cool if we were louder at prayer sometimes than we are when we were chatting with each other. If you have your Bible, why don't you turn to Psalm 91, the 91st Psalm. Glad to be back at the mission with everybody. Um, I, I, uh, you know that this isn't my church, and, and I know it's supposed to be the Lord's church, right? If we're doing this the right way, this is the Lord's church. But I think when everybody comes to the mission, if we're doing this right, you shouldn't think that this is my church. Like as in Pastor McAllister, you should think this is my church. As in you are saying it's my church. You're not saying it's my church. You're saying it's my church. And right. And and you see that when, when people come to church and they don't just expect other people to do everything all the time, but they say, you know, I want to have my part, whether it's making your fifty thousand layer brownies, Linda, that are really good back there. Or whether it's I show up to, to church today at 10 o'clock like I do every week with Brother Ben Whitney and Brother Tim Peake and Brother Matt Peake and Brother Dave Bodwin are out front shoveling. We were pulling up and I said, the town is shoveling. Ben, they never shovel. And he said, that looks like Tim Peake. And we pulled in. I said, well, Ben, that's because it is Tim Peake. Tim, <laughs> Tim Peake does look like Tim Peake. I can, I can tell you that's, that is how he looks. Oh, and Matt was helping and Brother Bodwin was there and it was... And, and, and I was, so I'm feeling great about that. You know, this isn't my church, right? It's everybody's church. And, and I'm going through my notes so I know what I'm talking about, hopefully, when you guys are here. And, and yeah, I'm responsible. Thank you for reminding. And um, Lynn shows up, and she gets out of her car, and she's walking into church. But she noticed the sign had fallen over. And many people just walk by that stuff, right? But this is Lynn's church. And so she went over there, and she picked up the sign and set it back up so it wasn't laying in the mud anymore. And I thought... This is not just my church, it's her church too, you know? I would have picked it up, I did see it on my way in, but I didn't have to because somebody from the church saw it, so I'm going to pick this thing up. I thought, that's a really great thing, and I think that should happen more often. Brother Randy wanted me to tell you guys, he's out of the hospital, he, he asked me to tell you guys today, but obviously he's still got a lot going on. He has to come back, needs a PET scan. We got lung cancer stuff going on. He does still have to be on oxygen. So he is out of the hospital, but he's still got a lot going on. But he wanted me to let you guys know that I told Reagan she could preach today if she wanted to. I guess she took me up on that. But Psalm 91, I'll read pretty quickly here. You might have to turn me up a little bit just so people can hear me over Reagan. But uh, Psalm 91. We're going to read that. We're just going to read all of it. Don't worry. There's only 16 verses. It goes pretty quick, but we're going to refer to all of this as we go through our lesson today. But the Bible says in Psalm 91, beginning with verse one, he who dwells in the secret place of the most high shall abide under the shadow of the almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in him. I will trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night. Anybody remember what we talked about last Sunday? We got to turn the light on, right? You don't need to be afraid of the dark. We are the light of the world. Nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that walks in there we go, darkness again, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked, because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the most high, your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling, for he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high. Because he has known my name, he shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be 
With him in trouble, I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. What an amazing opportunity. And testimony of the goodness of God. You can be seated here today. I'm going to do my best to teach the psalm of a bipolar priest. The psalm of a bipolar priest. I don't know how many of you guys have heard of Martin Luther. A few of you guys have. Now, not Martin Luther King Jr., totally different person, okay? Uh, Martin Luther, I mean, we're talking hundreds of years ago now, but he was, he was a priest, and when you talk about Martin Luther and you read historical accounts of Martin Luther, people will tell you, if you talk to one person, they'll say, really, really exuberant, energetic, happy guy, believed you could take on the world. But then you talk to somebody else, according to historical records, and they'll tell you, this dude was just down, like all the time, just down, down, down. Every time you were around him, he was just depressed. There's, there's, there's even records of him going to confession. Oh, okay, this is something Catholics do, right? They don't go to Jesus and ask for forgiveness of sins. They go to their priest. It's a tradition that they have in their religion. But he would go, some people said he would spend over six hours confessing his sins to his priest that this was a guy that if you talk to one person he's the happiest person in the world he's the kind of guy you'd follow anywhere he can make any situation look one he would turn the light on in any dark situation you talk to another person they say the dude is in confession for six hours talking about how horrible his life is and how bad he is and you can't be around him for more than two seconds without thinking this is an eeyore right here that's who this guy is and so a lot of modern people feel like if this dude lived today, a lot of people would have said, this guy is probably bipolar. I mean, with the mood swings that this guy has, of course, that's a man-made label to describe symptoms that we see. But, but they say this just really up and down. And I don't know about you. I, I hope I'm not bipolar. Maybe I am. I don't, I don't know. But, but I think we can all identify with some days feeling on top of the world and other days feeling like nothing is going right sometimes moment to moment I don't know about you but it, it, I can be just great and then not great and not great and then great again and so we can understand what it's like to to live a life that sometimes just feels like a roller coaster you know I think all of us could describe happy times in our life right now and I think all of us could describe difficult times in our life right now we understand what that feels like well martin luther is most famous right it was his he, 95 theses anybody ever heard of that well basically what it was is he wrote down in this document a bunch of points that he had disagreeing with the catholic church's tradition of indulgences and and basically what it was is if you wanted uh, s certain things done at the church most famously getting your 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 loved ones out of purgatory and into heaven which isn't biblical by the way but it was their tradition um, you could go to the church and you'd give them money and the priest would pray someone out of purgatory and into heaven. Well, Martin Luther was like, this is ridiculous. <laughs> and so he wrote this 95 Theses and he climbed these steps and, and very famously he nailed this, this document to the door of, of, his, of this local church. And he wasn't, it was the Wittenberg church and he wasn't trying to do something major, but at the time it was so visible that the Catholic church had a serious problem with this. And he was not willing to recant the issues that he had with this practice of indulgences. So they decided they were going to call him before the church at something called the Diet of Worms. Does anybody know what the Diet of Worms is? It is, it is, not, it is not a situation where your doctor says, Cody, you're not looking good. I'm going to put you on a Diet of Worms for the next three months. All you can eat are worms. The diet of worms. Brother Russell, I hope you never have to have the diet of worms. I hope not. But no, diet, it, it's, it was a term that used to be used for a meeting that is called to deliberate something. That was just a term that they used. A diet is a meeting to deliberate. And so he was called to the meeting to deliberate, and they weren't deliberating worms. It was actually held in a township called worms. So he was called to the diet of worms, and at the Diet of Worms, he was called before the church to answer for these 95 theses. And he was supposed to recant, but he didn't recant. And so 
when you understand, when you went against the church back then, there was, there was literally, your life was in danger now. Uh, they had a lot of political power. They could have people just taken care of. This guy was now a heretic. The church was after him. Well, luckily, Martin Luther had friends in Germany. There was a prince there who allowed him to stay in his castle, protecting him from all of these people in the church that wanted to kill him. Well, in the castle, he, had the, he, he created the first German translation of the New Testament Bible while he was in this castle being protected from these people in the church who wanted to kill him. He also, from this place, continued to share the issues that he had with the church, doing things that weren't biblical, and, and this, this idea began to spread. People began to say, yeah, why are we doing something that isn't in the Bible? I mean, part of Martin Luther's issue, he would say to the church at, at part of these 95 Theses was, why are you charging people for prayer when the church has enough money already? Why are you trying to raise money to build more churches and cathedrals from, from people's prayer and from their pain when you're already one of the most wealthy things in all of the world? Well, people started catching on to this, and from this eventually came the Lutheran church. Well, a lot of this happened when he was in this castle being protected from the church. And it is from this place that most people feel he wrote the song, A Mighty fortress is our God. It's an older hymn. A lot of people who've been in church for a, for a long time have heard the song before. And if you read it today, someone would probably have to translate it to you because people don't really talk like that anymore. But from this place, he wrote the very first lines of the song are a mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. A bulwark is a defensive wall that protects a city. And you can understand why he might write a song like this, right? A mighty fortress is a, This is a guy who's hiding in a castle so that people won't kill him for standing up for the Lord. And from this place being protected in this actual castle, he realizes that God is stronger and bigger than any castle. That as he looked over his life, and if you read the song, you'll find out he wasn't just talking about his body being protected. He realized that this physical castle showed me something about my Lord and my God, that in all seasons of my life, God protects the important parts of me me and that he is a protecting wall for his people so today our lesson that we're going to dig into all week long in our personal devotions and our family devotions is the psalm of a bipolar priest this mighty fortress is our god psalm 91 somebody tell me the background of psalm 91 it's very good that's not the background, though. That's just where, it's, that's where it is in the Bible. Nice try, though, guys. Yeah. It does come after, you know, 90 and before 92, but that's not the background. The background of the psalm. Somebody. No, good question. Yeah. Yeah. So keep that, keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. You're getting into the, kind of the middle of the lesson here. The background of the psalm, though, where it came from, and this is important to understand what it actually means and how it applies to our life. Psalm 91 was actually, it, 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 from Jewish tradition, you talk to historians, people attribute this psalm actually to Moses. When, when the, the tabernacle in the wilderness was being dedicated, so it had all been built. You now have the Ark of the Covenant, you have the brazen altar, you have the altar of incense, the table of showbread, you have, you have all of the, the furniture, the, the tabernacle, the tent has been built, and, and all, of the, the, 
all the skirting around the outside, the fence. And now what's getting ready to happen is, is you, and we've just read about this recently. You can read about, I believe, in Numbers chapter 7. All of the gifts that the children of Israel brought now so that people can operate within the tabernacle. And after this dedication, the Bible lets us know that over the tabernacle, during the day, a pillar of cloud came down and rested over the top of it. And at night, a pillar of fire rested over the top of it. And so if you look into this, historians and Jewish historians will tell you this was written right after this dedication when the pillar of cloud came down and just boom just rested upon the tabernacle and Moses walks into this tabernacle and after that experience he sat down and he began to write this psalm that we just read and you got to understand if you look at the beginning of the children of Israel and we just read it right in the first couple of chapters of Deuteronomy if you're reading your bread with the rest of the church we just barely read this this week he kind of goes through their history and and in here we're, with this psalm it's talking about God protecting us in dark times he talks about God protecting us from pestilence he talks about God protecting us from our enemies and I mean the children of Israel understand these things didn't they because they had been chased by Pharaoh's army and they had to fight battles against people as they went through the wilderness and and there was pestilence wasn't there times when pestilence came right through and was wiping people out and and I'm sure there were lots of animals in the wilderness that they had to deal with and at one time the earth opened up like an earthquake and people fell into the ground and they had to deal with lots of things and they didn't have a castle like Martin Luther did to run to they they didn't have some kind of strong army. That's, they were a bunch of slaves. They weren't taught to be warriors. And so they had to, to grab a hold of Jesus or of God. And he had to lead them to the great people that we read about in the book of the beginning of the book of Judges and, and in the book of Joshua. But when Moses walked into this place and the power of God just, just hit that tabernacle, he began to, to walk through that place and experience the presence of God. And when he came out, it was like, church, we don't need a castle like Martin Luther was blessed to have because we've got God and he said I got to tell you at the very beginning if you count on anything else sometimes walls fall down or somebody comes with a great big battering ram those things can fail but he's like listen people of God God is our fortress now if you look into poetry this is kind of important or even writers um, poets use these crazy things. If you want to know why I don't like poetry, they use things like zoomorphism and, and, and all sorts of crazy terms, right? I'm looking at Brother Russell because he likes poetry. Like, this is why I don't like poetry. You guys got all, I don't even understand the words that, that you use to, to come up with words that you use. I don't even get most of that, but, but it is important to understand different ways that people write and different ways that people relate, right? Because the, if, if you believe in the Bible, the Bible, what happened was the Bible tells us that people wrote under the inspiration of God. Yeah. So people write it down when God is telling them what they need to write. Yeah. But God understands human beings, and so he's going to use things that help us to understand his mind and his heart. Things like metaphors. Yeah. Anybody know what a metaphor is? Yeah. When I was growing up, I don't know why this just popped into my head. You can forgive me later and edit it out of the video. But I remember... <laughs> I remember growing up, there was these videos called Abs of Steel. See, I wasn't the only one who was in the 80s and 90s. Or how about maybe the all-time favorite, Buns of Steel. Now, if you follow the instruction on the video, you did not actually get buns, or at least not that I know of. I mean, I don't know anybody that showed me their backside after they watched the videos or went through them, but... But it's a metaphor, right? Abs of steel. They're not saying if you follow the video, your abs actually turn into steel. They're just saying they will get firmer. That's the whole point. It's a metaphor. Or how about uh, zoomorphism? Zoomorphism is, is when you take, you, you add animal characteristics to something that isn't an animal, like a human being. Well, I guess human beings you could consider an animal, but they're different in the eyes of God. They're made in the image of God. But you would say, or add animal characteristics to something that doesn't naturally happen. Like you could say, Cole, Cole, Cole there's a, he's, a, he's a road runner. Cole is actually not a road runner. You could say, Cole flies. Cole does not actually fly. But when you say those things, you're saying, somebody is really, yeah, the dude just flies. We're not calling him a bird. We're not saying that he has wings or he's got, boy, that dude, he's got 
Or how about when you come up to somebody and say, that guy's got chicken legs. <laughs> you don't, yeah, you don't mean the person actually has chicken legs. You just mean that they're skinny. Now, I bring these things up because it's important. If we're going to interpret scripture, and this is why a lot of people say you can't take the Bible literally. And it's because people don't understand some of these very basic things that we were just talking about. That in order to illustrate the characteristics of God or, or certain things, even we use buns of steel. In our lives, we use metaphors. Sometimes things like zoomorphism. They got chicken legs. We're trying to, we're trying to re, rather than trying to describe their legs, we're using something people understand. Chicken legs are scrawny and it's just easier that way. And so when we look in this, it's important to understand that there is a message that's trying to be sent with every single thing that Moses wrote down here. Yeah. And at the very beginning, when, he's, when he tells us, at the very beginning of our text, that, that God is our, our refuge, yeah. that God is our fortress, yeah. that God can be our dwelling place. Yeah. He's wanting to let the church know that what we, we have a God that if we live in a certain manner, like Brother Russell was talking about last week, if we're hitting that target like he was preaching about, that there is a place where you and I can get to that God can actually protect us. Now, I think the reason we as people of God struggle so much with this, con, with this, this, this concept is that we think God will protect us in all the ways we want him to. Right? If I'm sliding down a road and I'm getting ready to hit an embankment or a, a big, huge boulder, I could cry out to God for protection. And there's nothing wrong with me wanting God to stop that car and not smash into that boulder. There's nothing wrong with it. And could God do that? If he's all-powerful, he certainly could do that. And we've probably all heard stories of God doing things like that. However, God never once in the Bible promised that no one will ever run into a boulder with their car. But he does promise things like eternal security, yeah. eternal safety. Right. And so we have to understand, church, God is our refuge. He is our strength. Amen. But some of us get bitter or maybe we even doubt that because we expect God to protect us in ways he never 100% promised that he would. But he promises us in places that are so much more important than this physical life. To know that my soul can be secure. To know that if you're stronger than me, Linda, that you could beat up my physical body. But you can't touch my soul if I don't allow you to. That God will 100% keep the most important places in my heart, in my mind, and in my soul protected if I hit the mark and I live the right way. For some of us, that's not enough. Honestly, and that's why a lot of times we, we divert and we kind of do our own thing. Because I think if I do it this way, no matter what God did, maybe I can protect myself in this way or I can protect myself in that way. And what God's trying to say is, I want to protect you in a way that you can't protect yourself. In a way that no one else can protect you. God, at the very beginning, wanted us to understand he is a, a protecting place. But it's not usually in the places that we would like. But he also wants to be our hiding place. Yep. Yeah. Our psalmist used zoomorphism. You guys remember? <laughs> Talked about how wings and feathers, right? And this is where a lot of times, if you don't understand these concepts, people get all sorts of weird ideas about God, where someone could sit down and, now, what does God look like? And they draw him with these big wings on, have these huge feathers sticking out everywhere, and it's zoomorphism. He's giving these animal characteristics to God in order to illustrate something. And you can find this in other passages of scriptures where it talks about a hen and her, her chicks, right? Where they're not saying God has wings and he's got feathers. You're missing the whole point. What you're saying is that we have a God that's not only our shelter. He's not only a refuge. He's not only a protector. But God wants to be our special hiding place. We don't often think of God this way, but if, if you look at one of the terms the Jews used to describe God was El Shaddai. Has anybody ever heard that name before? Yeah. I see your hand, Becky. You got to wait a second. Just wait one second. What does that mean? My provider. That's one way of translating it. That's not wrong if you look it up. 
My provider. Most people will say almighty. My provider. That's what they would often say, the Jews would. But if you go, and this is why Brother Russell likes all these word studies. We do a lot of them for you, so you don't have to, but you should get into it because there's so much more to it. We were talking about this in devotion in my family this last week. You can understand a scripture at a very basic level, but if you keep digging into it, you can dig into scripture, the same scripture for weeks and weeks and just keep discovering more. But if you look into El Shaddai, it doesn't just mean like the Almighty or my provider. It doesn't mean that, but it actually, when you get back to the root of where it came from, you'll find the term breast. As in breast feeding. And, and where it comes from is this, this idea of nurturing. Now, doesn't that seem creepy or weird to think of God as our breast feeder? Right? Zoomorphism, metaphors. He doesn't. That's not what God does. He doesn't say he's our breast feeder anywhere in, in the Bible. But what they're getting at is that God is a nurturer also. He's not just this powerful thing that protects us from attacks, but he wants to be like a mother in our life, and he wants to nurture us. In other words, he cares about your emotions, and he cares about your feelings, and he is a God that when we pray, he wants to, with his presence, kind of wrap his presence around us and let us know, I'm not just protecting you, but I care about your thoughts, and I care about your feelings, and I, I care about your emotions. The Bible describes God in the masculine, right? The Bible says God is not a man that, that he should lie, right? Or the son of man, right? But, but the, the, my point that I'm making here is that the Bible describes God in a masculine way, but God is not a man, right? God is a spirit. God is not a man. He is a spirit. And a lot of times we think of God as a man, right? So God can't be the nurturing kind of motherly type of figure in our life. But you need to understand, human beings are all, all, men and women are both made in the image of, you want to see the full expression of God? You need the feminine and you need the masculine. That doesn't mean God's a femi. It just means you see feminine attributes. We're both, men and women are both made in the image of God. And so I don't care what you say, men and women aren't all the same, but they are different. And all women are different, and they like different things, and they act different ways. But if you want to get the full expression of the image of God, you have to see both a man and a woman to get that. So God is always described in the masculine in Scripture. But to fully understand God, you got to understand, He's not just this big macho thing. He has feelings and emotions, and He's just as nurturing as any mother has ever been he wants to be our hiding place so he doesn't just want you to pray for protection when your car's going taller bolder he wants you to pray and reach out to him when you're feeling depressed when you're looking at yourself in the mirror and you feel broken or you see all of your faults and all of your flaws and all of your failures he says come and let me be your hiding place in those moments when all you can think about is all the wrong things you've done or all the bad things that have been done to you he says come unto me all you who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest he is a strong fortress but he's also a nurturer these are the things Moses is trying to say to a group of people that don't have a strong army and don't have a city to run to God wants to be our hiding place Becca what were you going to say a couple minutes ago El Shaddai? Yes. Um, I was going to say God is our Lord. <clears throat> and, um, sorry. It's okay. I can keep going. If you think of it, you can bring it up later. <laughs> if you want to enter the hiding place, though, and this sounds common, but I want to show you how this works. The easiest and the quickest way to enter into the hiding place is through prayer. It is. That sounds really simple, but I want to give you an illustration. If you go into the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 7, we're not going to turn there because i got a long way to go. But if you're taking notes, if you're not taking notes, because I go really fast, you can go back to the video. And you can slow me down if you want to. That would probably be pretty comical. Acts chapter 7, though, we see that one of the early followers of, of the way, of, of Jesus, one of the early members of the church is a man named Stephen. 
That's what I was talking about earlier, about how God doesn't always stop the car from hitting the boulder, but he can protect us in ways greater than that. Stephen is being stoned. And the Bible says he went in, he called on Jesus. And you find a very powerful example of somebody in there. The dude's getting pegged with rocks. It killed his physical body. That time he didn't get saved physically. But you see his reaction and the things that he prays and the things that he sees. I know a lot of living people that aren't that alive. I, I do. People who can live for 50 or 60 years and be dead on the inside. And here's a guy that's going to be dead in a few moments getting pegged with rocks. And somehow he's at peace. And he's really almost praying for everybody that's pegging him with rocks. And what you see is when we can really cast our cares on the Lord, when we're either physically or emotionally or spiritually being beaten on or feeling down, when we can get to that place in prayer where we'll shove all of those things aside and get into a place of faith that God can bring that peace that passes under Standing, I got to tell you, church, we all know, everybody in here knows, the Bible tells us there's a time to be born, there's a time to die. And if God doesn't come back for the church while you and I are alive, there will be a time when you and I will not be alive anymore. And so there are things far greater tragedies than, than, than dying physically prematurely. And I hope you all live to be 180. <laughs> Some of you don't want to live that long. Okay, however old you want to be, I hope you live that long. But as Christians, I think sometimes we miss the blessings that God has. They're greater than, I think, some of the things we get upset with God about. Oh, he won't give me that, or he won't promise me. His. Yeah, but what you get is so much cooler. But we get there through prayer. It's so interesting. We were talking about God being a nurturer. The end of our text, I was going really fast, as it was 16 verses. But at the end of our text... The Bible says this. I'm just going to read the last two verses. It says, because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him with long life. I will satisfy him and I will show him my salvation. The end of our psalm here, the psalmist is talking about how great God is, how he'll protect us from pestilence, he'll protect us from, from danger outside. That's what it was. You don't need to go fighting lions and serpents, okay? Again, metaphors, right? People read this, well, I, I'm going to go out and stomp on a lion's head. We just read it in Psalm 91. Metaphor. He's saying dangerous things won't be able to get at you, right? But at the end, he talks about all these things. God is our fortress. God wants to be our hiding place. He'll protect us from pestilence. He'll protect us from danger. And at the very end, he switches into this really cool thing where he's like, you need to understand, God is not just a fortress. God actually wants to be your fortress. He's like, you, that needs to sink in, children of Israel. That needs to sink in, mission. God just doesn't want to be everybody's fortress. God's actually smart enough where he could say, I want to help everybody but Lee. Every single person through all of history but Lee. But God's also capable of saying, I want to be everybody's fortress, and it's very personal. Because he's God, and he could have excluded any one of us. But when he throws these promises out to all of us, we have to understand, while we were sinners, Christ died for Oh, you, Linda, and you, Sister Tammy, and you, Venus, and, and you, Quentin. He, he could have excluded any one of us, but he didn't. And that's important because some of us don't think a lot of ourselves sometimes. Some of us have a hard time with that sometimes. And it's like in this lesson, in the very middle, or at the end of the psalm, he's like, you need to understand, God just isn't a fortress. He wants to be your fortress. I was talking about this in Thanksgiving with my family last night as we were talking from Psalm 136, and it's through the whole psalm. You would have thought this guy is just like a, a record that's just stuck, you know, those old records that you just stick on one line. Because it starts off by saying, oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his... 
Yeah, you read the psalm. He keeps saying, blah, 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 for his mercy endures forever. Blah, 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 for his mercy endures forever. Blah, 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 blah. It's the whole psalm. Read it. It's like, dude, all right, we get it. We get it. You know, you're talking about just repeating themselves more than once last week, twice. And how, imagine a guy repeating himself like 15 or 16 times. You know, God wants you to understand something. The Lord is good, and his mercy endures forever. You know what mercy really means? Some people interpret it love, but when you actually look up the original, it means kindness. So hang on a second. You do something dumb, I do something dumb. Something horrible happens to me, and you think, why would anybody want me, or nobody would want, or I wouldn't want me? The Lord is good, and his kindness endures So that means there is never a moment that God doesn't want to be your refuge, Tim. There's never a moment, Becca, where God doesn't want to be your hiding place. You can't do something so bad. There isn't something so bad that could happen to you where he will just, oh, I don't want you anymore, or up, I'll think about it. That's not the way God works. We think like that sometimes, but we're putting our attributes on God. His word says about a billion times in this one song, his kindness toward you endures So any bad thing that you're thinking about right now, forever, forever, tomorrow when you think about it again, it's still covered by forever. 500 years after you're dead, guess what? Still covers it. That's forever. So he wants to be our refuge, our protector, our nurturer, and the way he feels about you, he's always felt about you, and he always will what an opportunity if we don't have the light on on our life it's just because we don't want to because he's so available why are you sitting in that chair right now because what because it's what we do (laughs) there's nowhere else to sit (laughs) your couch is at home that's probably good So, 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 wow, you you went all the Lord on it right right there, well, but but why are you, so, first of all, why are you sitting? You told, I told you you could, right? Quentin's not sitting, he's not in trouble, but most people sit down, why? Because they're, they're tired, or they feel like they will get tired, so I sit down, but you could have sat down almost anywhere, yeah, why do you sit down in a chair? Because it's here. That's what they're built for. At the end of the day, though, doesn't it require something to sit in that chair? Will will you move if you don't believe that that chair is going to hold you when you sit down? Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, it, when you think about it, every week when we come in, I mean, you might have at one point in time, but when I told you guys all to be seated, did you all turn around and kind of, you know, did, did you kind of push on it for a second? I said you could be seated, and everybody just pretty much sat right down, didn't you? And you can do that because probably for most of you, unless it's obvious, you guys have probably sat in a lot of chairs by now, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah. And again, I've seen some rickety things that I wouldn't sit down on, but unless it's obvious, if we've set these chairs out, I'm sure people, the first time they came here, I don't know, maybe you guys did, but you probably didn't come in and check out all the chairs first, you know, there were chairs set up, other people were sitting in them, so when they said, you can be seated, everybody just sits right down in these chairs. And I wonder sometimes, do some of us trust the chair we're sitting in? More than we trust the Lord sometimes. I asked you guys last week, how many of the problems you have in your life right now would exist if you believed every word that you read in the Bible? Most of the issues we have stem from a lack of, it isn't knowledge. I know what the Bible says, or I've been taught this, or I've heard it before, or I've read it, but I still have a problem. It's that big butt there. It's like, I've said it before, God hates big butts. He didn't like those. Because that basically means, some of you forgot I preached that a while ago, huh? 
I forgot I preached that a long time ago because I got into the middle of that sentence. But again, we get all the way through all of these things in our lives. Then there comes this big, this big but, and really where that comes from is we're having trouble having faith in the Lord. But when you understand, church, that he is committed to you for his mercy endures, his kindness endures, he has extended this hand to you and says, it will always be out there. And the only thing that stands between us and having protection in the important places, nurturing in the important places, refuge in the important places, is having enough faith to just rest in him, to just sit down there. Why did you sit? Because the Bible said, I can sit here. The Bible says I can count on these things about God. When he promised it in his word, I'm just going to sit right down. And, well, why can you sit? Because I come every week and this chair holds me. Why are you going to follow the Bible? Because I've been doing it for a while. And every time I sit in the Lord, it doesn't always turn out like I thought it would. But at the end of the day, if I just stay seated there, things work themselves out. I can trust in the Lord because he's committed to me forever. If you've ever been married before, it, it can be wonderful, it can be difficult, but the, the wonderful thing about it is the leap of faith, right? I'm committing to somebody, and I'm giving them emotional parts of me and, and physical parts of me, my commitment. I'm coming back every day, and what makes it special is they could walk away at any moment, but they haven't, and that makes it so special, and if we're willing to trust a human being that we know is flawed, we all are. What about a deity that says, I was committed to you when I decided to come and robe myself in flesh, when I created the world and decided one day I would die for your sins? I looked down through all creation and said Tim is worth it and sister Jackie is worth it he's never going to stop being committed why can't we just sit down and just rest in him and let him nurture us and become our hiding place what problem do you have right now that could go away if you just start trusting what God has asked you to do in that part of your life I still struggle with certain parts of scripture myself that I'm working on but I've conveyed with some of you as I've talked to you some things you struggle with I don't and it isn't because I'm more holy than you, because that's definitely not the case. But it's certain things, and I don't know if this makes sense to you. When you get rid of the question in your mind, peace follows. And the question is, am I going to do this? Right. Once you've read a scripture and you decide, I'm going to do this no matter how I feel, all of a sudden a peace follows right after that. There's no more torment. There's no more wrestling with it in my mind and in my heart. It's just gone just like that and it's replaced with peace but some of us are struggling so much in our relationship with God because there's certain things in here that were just well if I didn't do it or if he didn't say that or if I didn't have to or I used to do this or do I really have to do that and we create this torment and God's saying would you just sit down and just rest in me trust me with the things you wrestle with and then let me take away all of that turmoil there's going to be enough issues that we're going to have to hop over sometimes we do a good job of creating a bunch of extra ones ourselves he wants to be our refuge in our hiding place he wants to be our refuge he wants us to rest with him so we need to seek him we need to seek him daily i gotta stop here because i've got like two minutes but i think it's important that we understand that god wants us part of being in that hiding place is understanding that it's supposed to be a place of rest you guys just read yesterday about cities of refuge? When did that yesterday? You guys, you guys understand what cities of refuge were? Yeah. It, it wasn't for murderers. If I say, I'm going to kill Linda, and I went and killed Linda, I, I didn't, I, there's no place I could go. But if I was driving beside the road and my car went out of control and I accidentally hit Linda who was walking down the side of the road, in the culture back then, it didn't matter if I tried to kill her or if I accidentally killed her. Their culture said her family was going to come after me. That was part of the culture. It's kind of eye for an eye. But God wanted to say that there's a difference between you were driving the speed limit, you had snow tires on, it was a complete accident. We would call it, what, man, manslaughter. That would be our modern term. There's a difference between murder and manslaughter. So God was trying to say, if you get in a situation where someone accidentally dies at your hand, there are these cities of refuge that you could go to and what it did is it, it allowed the family to let go of revenge right I don't have to avenge that killing it it allowed the family to move on. you're no you can't God said you can't touch him in that city if there if it was manslaughter 
And so it let them off the hook and it let them move on. But it also continues to show us how God views our sin. When we make a mistake, when we do something we shouldn't do, it's, it's played out through all of Scripture how God says, I want to give you a chance to go somewhere and to deal with it and be safe. We call it repentance. Give you a Bible quiz and then we'll, we'll be done. The Bible says on the seventh day God rested. Why did God rest? Does God get tired? Yeah, he did it as an example. We know that because the Bible tells us in Isaiah that, that God does not get tired. But he wanted to show us there needs to be time that gets set aside. Not just to rest, because he took the seventh day and they ended up making it the Sabbath, which was what? It was a day set aside. You don't do, you don't do your work. You spend that day with your family and you spend that day. That's the Lord's. They used to call it the Lord's day. Now we find out in the New Testament that God created the Sabbath for us, not us for the Sabbath. And so there's a few different things there, but the principle remains the same, that there should be regular time in all of our lives where it's not video game time, it's not paying bill time, it's not texting time, it's not watching videos time. Linda, it's not even putting puzzles together time, as great as that is. But there should be time in all of our lives that we set aside and say, I'm resting in the Lord right now. And nothing interrupts this time because if I don't have that prayer, remember Stephen, that I don't get that refuge and I don't get that hiding place and I have this God who's reaching out to me and I don't reach back to him. He is our refuge. But we don't get it if we don't take time aside to rest in him. So this was the psalm of a bipolar priest. We have a God that is a mighty fortress. He is a protecting wall if we'll allow him to do that for us. Why don't we stay in the kingdom of God and be protected in ways that no one else can touch us, those special places inside of each and every one of us. You guys, we got like 13, 14 minutes before our next service. Thanks for paying such close attention and participating. It's your church too. We got a great church here, you guys. I can't wait to see what God works on us this week in our devotions talking about that refuge in that hiding place. It'll be a special week, special week.